Hi, this is Bern Sargis, and this is another edition, a very special edition of Inside OSU, because with us today is the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Tony Blair. We are delighted to have you. Thank you, Vince. Thank you. I know you've just returned from Borneo, and and uh, <laughs> and I, so I'm glad you have your coffee to kind of keep yeah. you perky during <laughs> all of this. I think our students who will be viewing this would be interested in this because when when they see people like you, they you know you're just very mature and staid and and uh, got it all together and and you've seen it all. Uh, but I've read enough about you that uh, it didn't all start out exactly that way. No, it didn't. And one of the things that, uh, I mean, first of all, I got into politics relatively late, I guess, only getting interested in it when I was 20 or more. Um, and secondly, I, you, you know, nowadays I make speeches fairly confidently. I always remember the very first speech, public speech that I gave. And I was 28 and I was fighting my first campaign. And I went to this large hall, and I prepared this speech for literally days. I've been preparing this speech. I got to the hall, and I always remember there were eight people in the room, in this vast, cavernous hall, and there were eight people. <laughs> and the thing I remember is halfway through my speech, I didn't know, I couldn't, I wasn't flexible enough at the time or mature enough to better sort of just say, well, look, why don't we just sit in a corner here and have a chat rather than me making a speech. Mm -hmm. So I kind of made out my speech, and I always remember to my dismay about halfway through the speech one of the eight just nodded off to sleep <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's how i began my public speaking i was referring to your uh your uh, musical career i mean you really you you're not you didn't yeah. just uh you didn't just kind of play an instrument you had a band and i mean you you must have had aspirations of mick jagger or something like that. I, I had huge aspirations unfortunately i had very little talent so <laughs> <laughs> I, I shared that <laughs> so i was no I, I was really keen on it actually uh and the w one thing i'm very thankful about is that all the sort of facebook and whatnot and the mobile phones and everything didn't exist in those days <laughs> otherwise there'd be recording and photographic evidence, which yep, would yep. have probably meant that I wouldn't be sitting here having this interview with you because it would have been and, pretty ghastly. And what, what was the name of your band? Ugly Rumors, which is actually a, a line from a Grateful Dead song. Ugly uh, Rumors. Yeah. I see. It's very appropriate. Do you ever uh, record anything? Fortunately not. Or we, well, actually, <laughs> there is a recording somewhere, but I think I've got the only copy and I'm keeping it. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you, uh, and, and in reading, you, you, you tried music, and uh, that was your goal, apparently, in, in life, and then you went to university, and uh, it, it almost looked like it was, it was at Oxford when you, really, uh, uh, when you really kind of turned into a, the direction you, you found today. Is that right? Yeah, it was, a, it was at Oxford that I, I became interested in both religion and politics at the same time. You were a good friend and, uh, and worked well with uh, President Clinton, but you also did that with President Bush, yeah. who were very different personalities. Very different. Uh, to contrast their personalities for me. I mean, President Clinton was very much, I mean, he was a kind of political soulmate in the sense, you know, we were both on the same side of politics. And he, he's, a, he's got an extraordinary analytical and intellectual capacity. Um, but most of all, the m most important thing to realize is that he was president in a different time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I often think is interesting is what, how would he have handled the aftermath of September the 11th? You know, because I remember my early conversations with President Bush when he first came to power, and we weren't political soulmates in that sense at all. Um, and, but he's a very, very easy and good person to get on with and very, very likable person. And so, you know, we, we, we got on perfectly well, but there was no real bond there until, I mean, well, I wouldn't say in any real sense until September the 11th, and then the whole world changed uh, for him, for me, and we took the same view about the security threat. You talk some to our students, uh, but I'd like you to comment now uh, on your advice to them uh, with respect to the, the, the global environment and their participation in it. What should they be doing? Should they study abroad? <clears throat> should they, what what, what, what yeah. would be your advice, and how important is it that they do so? My advice is really clear on this now, which is take advantage of the way the world's opening up. You know, your generation is the first generation, in my view, as young people, you know, for, in a country like America, you, the world is there in front of you. 
So go and explore it and enjoy it and, and, and learn about it because this is what will help you get on in life. I don't advise you just rush straight into the job and you know, in your early 20s and so on. You can take a bit of time to learn about the world. Mm -hmm. take, take some time to learn another language, experience another culture, realize that the way the world's changing today, you know, you, you, may, you may find of enormous benefit to go and spend some time in China or India or, or even Europe. You know, but the world's there. It's open in a way as never before. So go and enjoy it and experience and learn from it. You have definitely provided great value to our university and our students and community, and we appreciate it. And thank you for your service to the world. Thank you. That's very kind. You have been embracing and, uh, and aligning uh, Britain with the U.S. in the war on terror. Uh, was extremely controversial <laughs> for you especially yep, yep. and uh, to this day I read about protesters uh, showing up when you uh, you appear at various places uh, what uh, how did you explain it to your people I mean how did you how did you were you able to muster the support to invade Afghanistan and participate in the in the Iraq war um, yep I mean, it must it, be a terribly difficult decision. Well, it was. I mean, it's, the trouble with politics sometimes is they present you with binary decisions. So you go what this you way. You go this way or that. There isn't yeah. a kind of, yeah. in that way, there's not a third way. You know, you're, you, it's, yeah. it's one or the other. And when you decide, you divide. So, um, I mean, people sometimes forget I won my third election after Iraq and Afghanistan. So, you know, I think... But you lost a lot of seats in Parliament, didn't you? We did, but we were never really in danger of losing. And we still yeah. had a majority of... Yeah, you had 60, 60 yeah. vote margin or so. Over all the other parties. So actually, we were pretty secure even in that third term. And by the way, you know, the Labour Party in its 100 years of history never won two successive full terms, never mind three. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you were the longest serving Labour Prime Minister in history. Yeah, and that was partly because, you know, even if people disagreed with me over Iraq and Afghanistan, they... I, th I still think people actually want leaders to lead. Mm -hmm. you know, so in, in a way, the, the public's kind of curious ambivalence about this. It, they want to be listened to, but they actually do want to be led because that's what they elect you for. You know, they don't, you know, I often say to people when you, no matter what great wave of enthusiasm you come to power on, when you govern, it's all different. Well, looking back on it, <clears throat> looking back on it in Iraq, which is enjoying some security and, and progress moving forward to a, a democratic society, and as you said in your speech, one that embraces the democratic ideals, not just voting. Yep. Uh, looking back on that and then looking at Afghanistan today, uh, reflect on it. Was it the right decision? Well, I, I mean, I would say it is yes because I think if you'd let these societies, even it, even without weapons of mass destruction yes because I think if you if you look at what Saddam had done in his use of chemical weapons and then look at if you just left him there I think it's I mean personally I don't have any doubt you would have at some point had to deal with them right. so you could argue whether that was the right time or not but um, but the problem you got into in Iraq is the same one you got in Afghanistan but it's also the same you have in Pakistan and all over the region which is these, these very strong religious forces based on a kind of perverted view of religion that then destabilize. So the important thing is, you know, I think this is important when we look at what's happening in the Middle East now. I mean, getting rid of Saddam in a way was relatively easy. It took two months. Getting rid of the Taliban was relatively easy. Again, it took about two months. It's the aftermath that's been mm -hmm. tough. And the aftermath is tough because you have this, this, this movement worldwide uh, based on this perversion of religion which, which is difficult to deal with. Well, one thing, too, that, that and with the Arab Spring and, mm -hmm. and uh, Tunisia and, and Egypt and now Libya, uh, something that isn't talked about much throughout the Middle East is the role and the power uh, of the tribes. Mm -hmm. That, that, that these, are, these are countries which were kind of artificially created yep. and that the tribes, Often the real British. power, <laughs> yeah, the power lies... Uh, largely with the tribes and that is apparently very true in in Afghanistan yeah so so with this with this uh, meltdown of the dictatorships it's kind of what what emerges 
Uh, yeah, absolutely, and that, that, that's the key question. But he, here's the thing that I think is important to understand. You know, because I spent a lot of time out in the Middle East. I mean, I've just come back from my 72nd visit there since wow. leaving office. <laughs> okay, so I'm there a lot. You know, sometimes this tribal thing becomes an excuse. It, it, it is powerful, but actually the majority of people, if you gave them the chance to vote in and out a government on the basis of what they did for them, they'd be happy enough with that. Mm. It, it's, the, the, the thing is, unless you can provide order in these countries, these tribal influences then you know, form their militias and they, 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 then, they, they can try and warp the, the nascent democracy as, as it emerges. And you've just got to realize it's a very long game. You know, it took mm -hmm. us and our countries, I mean, our, my country centuries, your country, well, at least, you know, you could argue, um, you know, 100 years or more of, of, of struggle and decision and so on in order to emerge as a, as a real right. functioning democracy. Do, do you think Afghanistan is hopeless? Can Afghanistan <clears throat> ever be brought into the mainstream of... Um, it's not hopeless, world? no. But I do believe that the wider regional picture, what happens in Pakistan, and I think what happens in Iran particularly, is fundamentally important. I mean, my, the way I view this today is different from probably how I viewed it 10 years ago. I think there is basically one struggle going on, which is about and to do with the religion of Islam. And it's to do with whether inside the, 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 the culture and religion of Islam, what I would say are the modernizing, forward-looking forces can win over the reactionaries. So is that your, uh, is that your belief and policy and, and your role as the representative of the quartet, the so-called quartet, uh, in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, negotiations? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a dimension to it. That, that You see, for example, I don't think you can resolve Jerusalem unless there is a religious as well as political basis for it. Um, you know, so, and if you look at the issues to do with the Israelis and Palestinians, they're part cultural. They're not just political. Now, some people say to me, I'll keep religion out of it. I said, that's fine, but it's in it. Yeah.